I'm a human factor psychologist, uh, I too, architect, architect, for the Boeing Company. Uh, Connie Miller is one of our developers. Connie does uh, VR and AR development for the Boeing Company. And Dr. Christopher Reed uh, is a specialist in exoskeletons. Has done previous work for NASA and that type of stuff. So we're going to talk about XR and exoskeletons and how we are finding ROIs from these emerging technologies. So, Boeing, yeah, the, the, the magnitude of the kind of dollars we're talking about, we have over 150,000 employees in 65 different countries, uh, production workforce is you know, over, over 50K employees, uh, customers in 150 countries, 20,000 suppliers and partners. Um, every, every day, every two seconds, a 737, we're just talking only 737s, a 737 lands or takes off somewhere in the world. It's absolutely amazing. Uh, and mind-boggling to me how, how uh, you know, the magnitude of what we're talking about in terms of the volume of airplanes and the kind of money we're talking about here. So it's important that we, we do these things correctly. We have to do them right the first time every time. And when we don't, there's a lot of problems. And so we're, you know, we, we do our best to make sure that we don't have those kind of issues. Um, so why do we care? Well, so one of the, the biggest things that you can, one of the biggest problems at airline the airlines face is the airplane on the ground. And an AOG, as we call it, uh, can cost between $10,000 and $150,000 an hour. So it's a really, really expensive proposition to have those planes sitting on the tarmac. Um, we have a shortage of pilots, frankly. Uh, a lot of our pilots are aging out. So we're going to have this incredible demand for pilots in the near future. The increasing complexity of our aircraft, uh, we are turning out just gigabytes of data uh, for every flight that these planes are taking. Um, high risk, high cost, high regulations. Uh, medical field is very similar to us in this regard. And of course, safety. Uh, we have a, a mission called Go for Zero at Boeing. And we're trying to drive all of our safety numbers down to zero. So the first thing when you're trying to understand, you know, how do you get your return on your investment, you've got to make sure that you really study the process and understand what's going on. A lot of times we go out there and we kind of do this backwards. We go through the catalog, we call it checkbook engineering or catalog engineering, and we find some really whiz-bang cool thing and we go buy some of that. And we say, gosh, you know, this is going to deliver magic. And a lot of times it, it, it fails, frankly. So it's really critical that you go out there and make sure that you understand what's the soul of the intention? What are you really trying to do with this technology? And make sure that you go out there and actually partner with the end users and spend time out there in the factory. You see the group up here in the upper right-hand picture. Uh, we're out there in the belly of one of the tankers on the 767 uh, tanker program. And we actually spent uh, several weeks out there in the factory with the mechanics at their hip, literally uh, interviewing them, watching them work, listening to you know, their reports in terms of the kind of thing that they needed, and, and observing kind of how the process flowed out in the factory. Uh, the big piece, the big picture at the top there, that's a flow diagram. We go in there and we map out the process, make sure that we understand that all the different steps and how they work, and then we lean that process first, get that thing as smooth and streamlined as we can, and then we start thinking about technology. So it's really critical that you understand that. We're trying to figure out what your ROI, we're trying to figure out what ROI is going to be. Um, and also on the right hand side there, you see a, a couple of pictures from the University of Iowa. We've done some time motion studies. We engage with a lot of uh, universities to find out you know, how, how to do things better. And you can see there with that condition, we had a 90% improvement in quality and 30% reduction in time for manual tasks on the bench. So there's a lot of different ways to calculate your ROI, and it just depends on what you're looking for. Are you looking for productivity, productivity gains? Are you looking for quality gains? Are you trying to figure out how to, how to mitigate injuries? So, you know, have a very sharp focus in mind as to what particular ROI elements you're trying to address before you go in and start working on this stuff. So some of the effects that we're seeing of Boeing, um, wearable technologies of Boeing is we have fewer errors, we have improved training, reduction in assembly time, less travel, fewer injuries, and, and it all re results in decreased cost and increased quality. And um, it's, it's been a really powerful enabler for us. Again, but you have to start with the process and make sure that you're doing things with, not for, to the end users. With that, we're going to have Connie step up and talk about virtual reality and some of the work we're doing there. So I'm um, at our Houston office, and I support our work at NASA. So most of the VR stuff I've talked, I will talk about is in support of those projects. But for a quick um, overview first, 
XR um, covers the spectrum from augmented reality, which is overlaying content on fixed assets, to true virtual reality. Um, just trying to level set there where we are with those terms. So we've seen a lot of gains out of just product envisioning. We do this work with Unreal Engine, but strictly taking models, putting them on the into the engine, and then you're displaying them on a tablet or in a VR headset. Let's us envision products, um, see what we're going to build, and then helps with marketing of those products. So we have here um, a sample from the airline, looking at the uh, live room and things inside, and then from a proposal we recently did for Gateway, which will be a lunar orbiter. Recently, I've been most involved with a VR training simulator, specifically the Starliner, which is our new spaceship. Um, Training in VR in general will allow us to reduce our time on physical simulators. Those are quite expensive. We're not, not saying that we would ever get rid of them by doing it virtually. You need some of that tactile feel, but it certainly should cut down on the time. In this case, our um, Starliner simulator is also a multiplayer, and um, we can use it from distances. So we'll be able to do a participate in the training having the simulator tied in with the physical trainer at NASA's Johnson Space Center. They'll be able to tie into those uh, training scenarios remotely through VR. So the big thing that we're seeing from the VR stuff in this scenario, it lets you be there, lets you feel like what it's going to be like in that scenario when you get there. So we have a quick video here that talks about that, if you could play the video. Space Station is the largest, most complex international scientific and engineering space project in history and the world's largest endeavor into space to date. Boeing has been the International Space Station's prime contractor since 1993 and is responsible for the design, development, integration, testing, delivery, and sustainment of U.S. build elements. Boeing supports a variety of capability enhancements that will enable use of the ISS through 2024 and beyond, including... Just kind of cut that off. So that's just kind of a sample of what our VR looks like when you're there. You can actually feel like you're in space. So we now have Brian going to talk about some of our VR projects. So the picture that you see up here is kind of funny. What's old is new again. On the left-hand side, we see uh, Dr. Tom Codnell. And he and Dr. David Meisel back in the early 90s actually coined the term augmented reality of Boeing uh, on this very project. This is a triple set of wiring loop, and they're trying to figure out ways that they could speed up uh, production and also reduce errors in, in the uh, production process. And on the right hand side, you see the, the KC or the uh, 767 tanker. And that's been the more recent uh, effort that we've had. It's interesting how uh, the technology has, has made leaps and bounds in terms of improvement and, and uh, in terms of the quality and ease of use and all that type of stuff. The early stuff was really, really pretty rough to use. I actually worked in, in wearables back at that time. Okay, so in digital aviation, we use an uh, AR for maintenance training. Uh, Cannons can go out there and they can put on the headset, they can walk out to the plane, receive instructions from the point of use and time to need and walk themselves through a particular job scenario, whatever task they happen to be doing. In, in the design review, uh, Connie actually uh, was kind of a hero on one of the stories, kind of cool. Uh, on the space, um, the space station, they were trying to figure out how to put water tanks on the, on the space station. Right. You want to talk about it? <laughs> so Connie, they, they had an impasse between the chief engineer and the staff. And the chief engineer said, okay, full speed ahead, we got this locked down, let's go. And the staff said, no, we don't have room for some of the pipes and stuff in the back. And so Connie, hearing this conflict, went and bottled this really quickly and put it on the headset, went and put it on the head of the chief engineer. And after about 10 minutes or so, he figured out that they were bribing. So he said, you know, gosh, I'm so glad that you guys pushed back on me and we didn't go ahead with the plans as, as we had intended because it would have cost us a lot of money and time. We would have messed up the schedule. A factory layout, we have a real-time collaboration tool where you can actually lay out your factory on a laptop in a, a kind of a gaming type environment, and then you can turn it around and put on all of it and actually walk it in one-to-one -one scale, which is really nice to be able to, to see if you can have interference issues with um, live you know, tools. See, it's a mix of the, the uh, digital assets and the real live toolboxes and things like that. In production, we're using it on F-18 Super Hornets. So, um, the AR technology is not granular enough or 
reliable enough yet in terms of uh, the, the granularity, how, how tight it can get in terms of tolerances to actually uh, locate fasteners, but it can identify fasteners, and that's what we're using for them there. Uh, B22 Osprey with sealant inspection. It helps our inspectors to go through and do a better job to make sure that they completely uh, check all the different sealing locations. And on the CH47, otherwise known as the Chinook, um, again, supporting hands free wiring installation just like in the tanker. So there's the uh, 767 tanker. It's a complicated assembly. In design configuration, what we would do is actually, instead of the mechanics looking at drawings and whatnot, and then trying to imagine how these different uh, elements would come together in the plane, where it's noisy and we're putting two and a half times the wiring into one time the plane. They can actually walk on, put on a Holland's headset, look up, and they can just see where the wiring goes, and then trace it in the air in real time. We have a little video for you, about 30 seconds. So a lot of folks are here looking at virtual reality, augmented reality, and obviously that plays into the verbal technology front. But then there's the physical domain, and that's pretty much where I come in to fill that space. Looking at exoskeleton technology, how do we use it to improve human performance? How do we use it to improve safety and ergonomics? Uh, looking through our factories, you know, one of the things that we're starting to see a lot of is the decrease in safety uh, incidents which is a good thing. I mean, we all want this. But what we're seeing left over are the ergonomic-based injuries. And so this is, is pervasive throughout our factories. It's obviously something that's not unique to any one site or any one program. And so we're looking at other types of technologies, other types of disruptive methods to come in and figure out unique ways to solve these problems. So looking at exoskeleton technologies, they exist beyond industrial settings, obviously we're here just talking about industrial exoskeletons, but also medical and military systems, and some of the folks may be familiar with that. In industrial systems, we break it down to three fronts. So we have assembly assist systems, systems that are essentially supernumerary arms. If you had extra hands, what would you do with them? Uh, if you look at postural assist systems, when you look at awkward postures, they make up a component of the number of ergonomic injuries that we have. And so can you help somebody with a squat assist, a stoop assist, any kind of overhead work? Uh, and then the last piece, I like to call this piece the unicorn. It's essentially where we wish we could be, um, and it's what's starting to happen. So looking at the, the strength assist systems, you have grip assist, you have full body assist, arm assist. These are the systems that are starting to come online that go beyond normal and capacity. Um, when we look at Back up one. We look at the figure on the right, chest test test. This is what we spend years doing. I mean, essentially, when we break it down, we don't just take any exoskeleton off the shelf and put it out there and use. We spend years going through collaborations with the individual developers, going through university tests, going through field tests, looking at usability constraints, looking at safety constraints, ergonomics. And generally, how does it fit the usefulness, the usability, and the applicability to the job that you're looking at? Because ultimately, when it comes down to it, the end users have to accept it. If they don't, it's a useless hunk of job. And so we tend to look at things in, in groups. So looking at these different gated processes. So looking at opportunity and bringing in technology that comes in to fit potentially a risk or a problem that we see, doing a lot of shop trials, evaluating the efficacy of it. And then looking beyond that and going into a more granular process where you start to look at the details of the system. Is the system going to hurt me? Is there a potential ergonomic-based risk if I wear this over a long period of time? And that's where a lot of the laboratory studies come in looking at the biomechanics or looking at the anthropometry, the size and fit, and the combination for your population. And then in the long run, you throw it out there. 
let it sit there for type weeks, months, and even years. We'll uh, we've been playing with exoskeletons since 2012. We look at them as a suite of tools, not as a single uh, source of solution. Uh, and so when we're looking at the pipeline for all these different exoskeleton technologies, where do they apply? Put them out there. What's the feedback? What do we need to change? Work with the developers to change. And then make sure that the system is going into sustainable. So this is where we do a lot of data diving. So bringing in a lot of the data analytics experts, looking at big data, finding trends in where the injuries are happening and what they're pertaining to, uh, looking at strategic alignment, bringing in the right technology uh, that fits the bill. So do I need a, a passive device? Do I need an active device or a powered device? What's the end use, the end goal? And so when we look through the different types of uh, phases, you're going from the qualification phase going to a pathfinder approach, which is where we put it in a single site and essentially look at it from a, a sink or swim perspective, and then go into the best practice avenue where we apply it to multiple sites, because there are nuances between the programs and between the sites. So you have things looking at fabrication, things looking at application for assembly, things looking at warehousing. And so that's where all of that builds into an enterprise process. What are those lessons learned? What are those best practices? And how do you embed that into the processes, the trainings, the evaluations, the certifications, all the things that need to be done for a certification and sustainment process? Now, all of that combined, you may look at me like I'm the only guy doing exoskeletons, but I'm not. I mean, quite literally, in this room, I can see a few faces that I play with exoskeletons with. Not only developers, but also other folks in manufacturing and industrial sectors. And we all play off of each other. So what I'm getting at is it's built by a village. We don't do this on our own. And so a lot of times inside the company, we put in each other and we lean on each other to put our, our ideas together and make sure they're effective. But then outside the company, we do a lot of benchmarking, a lot of best practices, a lot of training of notes, things that, of course, are, are not proprietary, but are for the, the greater good. And so that's where, essentially, if you build your, your, your crowdsourcing scheme for that end goal, for whatever you're trying to do, you can get there faster. And we've found that crowdsourcing actually helps. So if you can cue that video. Exoskeletons are a game changer. Anything that makes us better, safer, faster, stronger, you'll be able to perform at your highest level for your entire lifespan. In some ways, it is the stuff of science fiction. I see huge potential for these devices in industry. You have the military side increasing the capability of the warfighter so that soldiers come home safe and sound. You have the medical helping people who are paraplegic walk again. You have the urgent industrial side of where the industry is going. You have construction. You have manufacturing. People that would have had to retire from factory jobs will be able to work longer and feel better when they go home. They'll wake up without back pain. We'll see people reaching for exosuits instead of material handling devices that they use today. The big area right now is in safety. How well these systems work, what's the risk assessment for these systems to not hurt a person. Standards is the only way to get us there. It would be ideal if there was some consensus on how to evaluate these devices so that results can be compared across groups and integrated so that we can learn more than having each individual group do it their own way. ASTM is a mechanism by which we can have our subject matter experts bring their vision into unification with customer expectations. <coughs> so in academia, developers who are in industry, producers who are in government, all of us have to get together to get on the same page. I like that there's poor representation amongst small companies and large. Standards are going to be a key part of helping us actually talk with each other and bring community together so that we can really move forward in this area. You're going to start seeing this as a more pervasive type of technology where it's almost viewed as a tool. We're thinking about how can we use exoskeletons for futuristic type tasks? What if we had exoskeleton devices built into spacesuits so that our astronaut population doesn't get fatigued and potentially injured? I think you will see a proliferation of applications in military, medical, and industrial exosuits. It's going to be a really wild world. Switch back. 
So this is where we close off. So if you think about it, what is the purpose behind the technology? And that's coming back to the ROI. What is it improving? Is it improving safety? Is it improving quality, productivity? Those are different avenues. Can you measure it? And if you can measure it, does it make sense when you compare it to other options out there? And so that's where you're looking at identifying, quantifying, qualifying, all these different capabilities. And then bring it down to what matters, the integration and sustainment. You can have the best technology on the block, but if it's not used, it's useless. And so that's where you look at the safety again, looking at the effectiveness, using that crowdsourcing and pushing the bill. Um, the, the last piece that I would leave is what happens when the technologies merge? What happens when there's a convergence? And you start seeing big data playing with artificial intelligence and artificial intelligence playing with physical manifestations like exoskeleton technology, uh, as well as virtual reality and augmented reality. How does that all play together? And it's an interesting sandbox to play in that I'll leave you guys at. And so I'll go ahead and switch. We're going to go to questions, I believe. I think everybody's hungry. <laughs> hey, well, thank you very much. Bye.